Okay, so I'll start today with a new topic called Timoshenko beams. Uh, we already covered Euler Bernoulli beams, uh, which work for what, what kind of scenarios? Euler Bernoulli beams works well for? Long slender beams. Long slender beams, right? But what happens when the beam is shorter? Euler Bernoulli beam is not as accurate. And the reason is because if you have a shorter beam, now when you apply loading, you now get shear a good amount of transfer shear deformation. You can almost imagine a very long beam that deforms. Most likely, the mid-surface dominates the response. Do you agree? Like the neutral axis basically dominates the response. But when you have a short beam, the behavior starts changing a little bit. And it starts, you start to have contributions from the transfer shear deformation, okay? So today's lecture is about Timoshenko beam. And, and Atticus also has Timoshenko beam theory included in their suite of beam elements. It's, it's actually a very accurate uh, element. And uh, because you may use that in the future, potentially, I do have to go through that theory. And I'll, I'll teach you uh, a little bit about this. I will not derive the theory from scratch like I do in a different course, more advanced course. But I'll give you the equations and we'll use the total potential energy to derive the element equations as well. Uh, so if we move here to the next slide here, uh, Timoshenko beam theory is applicable to short beams in general, uh, which require the uh, shear flexibility. Uh, this theory accounts for transfer shear deformation, which in order Bernoulli beam theory, we assumed what? Zero. We assume that transfer shear deformation is zero, that the normal stays perpendicular to the neutral axis after deformation and during deformation. Um, so this theory is very good to, to apply to, to thick beams, short beams. Uh, typically, a good ratio will be 1 over 8, and I'll show you the proof later. 1 over 8, eight uh, T over L. So thickness over length, 1 over 8. Um, the response in this theory is just like Euler Bernoulli beam theory. The variables of interest are assumed to be independent of the beam cross section. They only depend on the length, X. Okay? And we'll talk about some of these theories, uh, some of the assumptions in the theory. Uh, one of the other things in uh, 2D theory, we're assuming that the, plan the, the cross section remains planar, so it doesn't warp, although you can actually advance the theory to include warping. But it will be a significant amount of work to go through that in a class like this. Uh, like I said to students, we can make it a great <coughs> exam problem. We'll, we'll not do that. But I, if I gave you a paper that discusses finite elements, um, I think you will follow it. I really do, okay? Because I think we cover the fundamentals of it. Um, so the displacement assumptions in this theory are uh, u, uh, those are the deflection in, in this direction, u. Um, it's, a fun it's a linear function of theta, okay? And I'll explain what that theta means for in a second. Uh, w is a transverse deflection and you can see that these variables only depend on x, okay? So we're assuming that u and w only depend on, on x, and then we're not looking at deformations outside of the plane of the board or, or, or the screen, okay? Um, so <clears throat> let's look at what w is doing here. So w is a transverse deflection from this point all the way up to the neutral axis here, okay? So that's, it. that's w right there. Uh, W prime, which is the, the rate of W respect to X, what that's giving you is uh, basically the deformation of that cross section, perpendicular to that cross section. So how, how much angle change I have, uh, uh, the perpendicular line to the cross section, to the neutral axis, okay? So that's giving you the total amount of deformation uh, to a line that's perpend perpendicular to the neutral axis. And when I look at theta, that theta right there, that theta is really the angle change from a straight cross section. So how much, how much that cross section change in angle, basically? Okay. So I wanted to ask you one question then. Uh, what is the change in angle then? If I start at 90 degrees, what is the change in angle right here? So because that cross section changed angle, right? The cross section read to the neutral axis, if I took a square here, what is that angle there? 90 degrees, right? So I started with 90 degrees, and now when I move to this, 
deformed state, this cross section has an angle relative to the straight line here, right? And so what is the angle change uh, relative to the neutral axis? I start at 90 degrees. What will be the difference between W prime and theta? So that angle right there gives me the angle change. So that angle change is really dW dx minus theta x. You know, so that's what I should get for angle change. So that I do have a transverse here, right? In the order Bernoulli beam theory, this cross section will have been remain will have remained perpendicular to the cross to, to the neutral axis. In that case, there's no angle change, right? Um, so again, theta is a rotation angle of the normal. So how much that you know how much that cross section change in angle? Uh, then you have the slope of the midline, which is W prime. That makes sense, isn't it? So if I have a curve, and that's W and that's X, isn't that the slope W prime, right? So that's also W prime in this case. Um, so the variables of interest in this theory, what are the only unknowns here that you see? Sorry? X is not an unknown. X is, a, is basically a coordinate of the system, right? So, so let's, let's, let's think about it. Let's look at the displacement assumptions I, hear, I have here. So what are the unknowns that you see there? W and theta. Those are the only two unknowns, right? Uh, so, so I am really looking for when I deform this beam, I'm looking how much shear deformation I have, how much theta do I get, and how, how much W do I get. That's really what we're looking for, right? So these are the two unknowns. Um, if I try to calculate uh, the shear, the, the strains, the strains I get, uh, the only non-zero strains are epsilon and x, e, epsilon xx, twice epsilon xz. Okay, uh, epsilon xx is simply the derivative of u respect to x. Everybody agrees with that? Yeah. So therefore, I get z theta prime basically, and then the shear, the shear is just the derivative of u respect to z plus the derivative of w respect to x, right? That's what the shear definition is. And if I were to apply this formula, I get minus theta plus w prime. That makes perfect sense because we just said that the shear angle, which is a change in angle, right, after deformation, uh, should be w prime minus theta x. And we saw that graphically here. That's theta, that's w, and then the angle change is basically uh, w prime minus theta, right? So you see that that works out? So, so this theory clearly show, you know, this shows clearly that this displacement assumption is consistent graphically to what we just, just discussed. We can also show that this displacement assumption is, uh, is uh, also consistent to no warping. We can show that, you know, by making v equals zero, uh, right, v, out of plane, there's no deformation. Um, but, you know, Abacus can handle 3D, Timoshenko, and, and, you know, in 3D space, of course. But I don't want to do 3D here because my purpose is to show you the, the, the basics of it. Uh, at some point, you know, it becomes unwieldy to really try to show this in class. As, as long as you understand the basics, we can extend that to anything you want, okay? Um, any questions on, on the field here? Uh, why is it 2 times epsilon xz? So, so the definition of here is twice the engineering strain epsilon xz, right? So the engineering strain gamma, shear strain, is twice uh, epsilon xz. Okay, that's the definition. How accurately could you apply that theory to columns? Columns. So uh, can you describe um, what kind of applications you're thinking of? Just like, uh, like simply supported uh, beams for the columns and then... This, this theory is, is, is very advanced, so it's going to cover short and long beams. Very well. Okay, so columns also are included. Okay, okay. Uh, this theory is actually more advanced than order Bernoulli beam because in order Bernoulli beam you're restricted to long beams, right? Uh, but we'll we'll talk about this Timoshenko beam quite a bit today. And you'll you'll see some limitations that we have here too. Um, now let, let's look at what's going on with the axial strain. You agree that the axial strain is varying linearly. Uh, through a thickness relative to the rotation theta prime. You see that? 
So, so epsilon xx is a linear function of z through a thickness, while w here does not, does not depend on z. So w, if I, if I take a point here, and this deforms to the neutral axis, uh, that, that amount w that moved is the same as if I choose a point here, that point moves up an amount w there as well. Okay? So every point that moves an amount w, the only change we have here is that the axial strain, which is a strain along the fiber direction, this direction, the outer surface of these fibers, that strain is a function of z. So for example, what is the deformation, what is the axial strain at z equals zero? Zero. So meaning that the neutral axis is not experiencing any stretching. So clearly, the, the, the deformation is coming from basically deformation from bending. That's what's causing the axial strain. Just like in order Bernoulli beam theory, remember, stress equals mz over i, right? So the stress varies linearly through the thickness, just like that in Timoshenko beam. Sorry, in Timoshenko beam, we also have the same case. So let's look at, um, with these displacement assumptions, in a more advanced course, I could teach you that the governing equations for this beam are given by these equations given here. Uh, there's two equations, one for theta and one for w. So there's two equations, uh, and, and one, of course, you know which one is dominated by who. So by looking at higher order derivative, derivative, we see theta as the highest order derivative. We also see w as a higher order derivative for the second equation. So, so this one corresponds to theta, this corresponds to w. Okay, EI here is the bending stiffness. Okay, so E is the Young modulus, I is the moment of inertia. Uh, G is a shear modulus, A is the area, K is a so-called shear correction factor, okay? And I'll explain a little bit more what the shear correction factor is, and we'll go also into what Abacus has to offer for, for shear correction factors. Um, again, the variables of interest in these two equations, I will know what EI is, I, know, I will know what K and G and A are, um, I will know the loading distribution, P, is the loading distribution on the beam. Uh, so the only unknowns really are theta and W. Those, those are the unknowns I'm trying to find uh, really for this, this theory. And if I know theta and I know W, what do I know? The displacements. Uh, sure, displacements. And if I know displacements, do, what do I know? Strains. And if I know the strains, what do I know? Stresses. And so once I know the stresses, I can calculate whether the beam will fail or it, or it will be, it will survive. Okay. So just just give the big perspective here uh, that uh, this course uh, is giving you the fundamentals of what finite elements is. But you want to also look at the angle. What what we're trying to accomplish towards the end is really use these models to find, uh, you know, whether a structure can survive the loads is subject to. That's one potential. Uh, thing that you could do with these models. Another thing could be for a heat transfer problem. How hot does it get? Uh, can I size the design so it doesn't get that hot in one end? Um, I can go on and on and on, but just keep that in mind. That's what we're trying to do, trying to give you that, that the background to all that, okay? Uh, so two equations, two unknowns, Gurin equations coupled. Um, and uh, so if I took a, a simple example, you guys know this. Uh, I have a beam under an axial load, P. Uh, what is the deflection at the end using order Bernoulli? What do you learn in mechanics and materials? Deflection? P o cubed over 3i. Perfect, P o cubed over 3i. How many of you knew that? Just memorize that one at least, All right? So, so if you take a bar and I apply axial deformation, what is the deflection at the end of the bar? I have a bar and I apply a deflection at the end. PA over EA. Yeah? So if I apply uh, to a beam, I apply a, a transverse load at the very tip, what do I get? PA cubed over 3EI. Does everybody remember that? Now that he said it, do you remember? PA cubed over 3EI? Okay. Just go back to mechanics and materials. I think you're going to need that to kind of revisit this so, so, you, so you know what we're talking about. 
What are the boundary conditions? The boundary conditions are simple. Uh, the deflection here is zero. Your grease clamped. There's no rotation either. Theta is zero also. Uh, at this end, do I have any moments applied? Moment is related to EI theta prime, so I have no moment. Okay? And then here, you can clearly see that this boundary condition is shear. You know that. Let's see. Maybe you may not recognize this, but I think you, you will after I explain it to you. Remember that twice epsilon xz is gamma xz, which is a transfer shear. Remember that's what I had, W prime x minus theta x? Remember that? I see some blank faces. I'll show you the, the formula very quick. This is what we had for gamma xz equals minus theta x plus W prime x. You see that? So that's really the shear at that end. So then I look here, and I get gamma. What is gamma times g? Shear stress. Shear modulus times shear strain gives me shear stress, right? What is shear stress times area? Total force in that cross-section. Shear force in that <coughs> cross-section. Well, it makes sense, total sense, that that's equal to F, which is the total force applied at the very end. I should have put P here, by the way. But I think you get the idea. Okay? Do you follow what I just did very quickly? Okay, so... So I have the two Gorin equations. I have the boundary conditions. I have, um, you know, second order differential equation there. Second order differential equation here. Here, four boundary conditions. I should be able to get the constants, and so you can do that very quickly in Mathematica. I'm not going to do that here, uh, because that can be done, you know, very quickly. Uh, but when you get the tip deflection, we don't get P L cubed over three i in this theory. We get PL cubed over 3i plus PL over KGA. Okay? We get this extra term that did not show up before. Okay? This term here is what you mentioned, and that's what you learn in mechanics of material. Remember mechanics of material? Uh, that's what you have gotten, PL cubed over 3i. Okay? Uh, but now this theory is adding this extra term right there, and this K is a shear correction factor. Let me explain that in a very simple way. What is the distribution of shear through the thickness of a beam when I apply loading? Parabolic. parabolic. Who said that? How many of you agree that's parabolic? Okay. If you don't remember, I want you to go back and review mechanics and materials. Okay. Uh, and so, um, if you look there, it's parabolic. However, we have a problem, and the problem is if I look at the shear. Strain. What is the shear strain? Does the shear strain depend on Z, the thickness? Pay attention here. Is it, is it really a function of Z? Some of you are saying yes. But I don't see Z here. Epsilon XZ is constant through a thickness. So if epsilon XZ is constant through a thickness, because X is a coordinate, it's an X coordinate, right? It's not Z. So right, this does not depend on Z, only on X. Then that's constant through a thickness. And so if we look here, if the shear strain is constant through a thickness, how do I get the shear stress then? Shear strain times shear modulus gives me shear strain, right? Shear stress, right? So what does that mean? Shear stress is constant through a thickness. But in reality, it's not. It's parabolic through a thickness. So what the shear correction factor is doing, and, I, and if you're interested, I can show you the derivation after class. What it does, it corrects for that error. Okay, and he's using energy methods. You can use energy uh, theorems to actually find out that, in fact, what you should have is, um, you know, a shear correction factor. For a rectangular beam, cr a rectangular cross section, what you will get is five over six. A k equals to five over six, and uh, we can go through the different k's that that you could get. Abacus gives you those, and they discuss them. Uh, but for now, I wanted to make sure you guys are aware of that at least. Um, does that make sense, my explanation on the shear correction factor in a very simple way, okay, without getting lost in the weeds? You, you get it? Okay. Um, so what this is telling you is uh, if I had a short beam, or the Bernoulli beam is going to do a disservice because it's going to be on the predicting the real deformation. Uh, the real deformation now is also adding a contribution due to shear, okay? And this term will be missing altogether. If I take the ratio of this total tip deflection 
and I divided it by the tip deflection you get in order balloon beam theory, and I make all these calculations for a rectangular cross section, and I take k equals 5 over 6, which is true for the cro rectangular cross section. And I did all those calculations. I get 1 plus 3 over 5, t over l squared. t is the thickness of this beam, l is the length. If I plot this, I will get how far off Timoshenko is at the tip compared to Orle Bernoulli. You agree? That's basically what I'm doing. So if this was equal to 1, then Timoshenko and Orle Bernoulli beam coincide. And if they're off, then we know that Timoshenko must have something more that Orle Bernoulli beam is not doing for me. So let's see the plot for that. If I plotted that, um, you can see very, very quickly here that Timoshenko beam for very short beams, uh, this ratio does a very, you know, you can see that the ratio is close to 1 um, for small uh, L over T. So lengths that are small compared to the thickness, Timoshenko beam, you know, is way off. Uh, but there's a point in time where things start to look um, pretty close. And that ratio is about 0.2. Okay? Uh, so, sorry, 1 over 8. So, 8 over 1. Typically, about here, order Bernoulli beam and Timoshenko are fairly close. Okay? Uh, but I'll let you plot that at home so you can check it out. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> I ruined the surprise. So now, now that you guys kind of understand the top level of Timoshenko beam, again, summary works for short beams and uh, for longer beams. Uh, it tends to actually converge to order Bernoulli beam, okay? Uh, order Bernoulli beam is deficient in the way that it does not handle short beams very well because it's missing what? Shear deformation, okay? Are you guys uh, awake, listening? Okay, excellent. Um, so now what we're going to do is actually start looking at how to derive uh, the finite element equations for order Bernoulli, sorry, for Timoshenko beam and for Timoshenko beam, what is the first step? What is the first step when I give you partial differential equations? Stronger. If I want to derive the, the, the finite element for the problem. Start with the strong form. Get the I start this very nice. I start with the strong form, which I already gave it to you. I showed it to you. And I for formulate the weak form. That's my first step. Everybody agrees that that's what we're going to do? Okay. So if I go and do it, uh, I have these uh, two differential equations, uh, and uh, what I can do, because I have two of them, and if you follow my notes from previous lectures, I showed you how to deal with two equations, how, what to do in those situations. Uh, in this situation, you have to multiply the first equation by z theta. Okay, so it's, I just made up a weight function. We could call it any variable. We can call it a, b, c. I just call it z theta. And I put theta here to remind myself that this theta this weight function corresponds to the higher, higher order derivative of that partial differ that differential equation. <clears throat> uh, so what I've formed here, what I've formed here is a weighted, is, is, sorry, the residual function. And I'm making the residual function here orthogonal to the weight function z theta. That's what I've done. And to that, I'm adding, uh, I can do it either together or separately. I decided to do it together to, to move quicker in class. Uh, but I added the second equation, which is really corresponding to W because it's the highest order derivative. And I formed the residual function for that, made the error orthogonal to the weight Z W. So now I have two weight functions that I'm going to track from now on. And so from here, this is a strong formulation of the problem. But if I were to use these to approximate the solution to the problem, then I have to use strong form Galerkin. If I use strong form Galerkin, then I will have to satisfy essential binary conditions, natural binary conditions, plus now I have a higher order derivative that I have to handle. Is that clear? Okay, so what I've done is then, uh, I, if I multiply z theta to each of these, uh, I realize I have two derivatives here. Uh, so I can split the order of differentiation. Here I have a one single derivative I'm not going to split the single derivative, just leave it alone. So for this is the only term, for this is the only term that I have done that to, 
on the first equation. The second equation, I also realized that I have a prime on this whole thing, which is really a double prime on W, so two derivatives on W. Uh, so I want to split that order of differentiation. Uh, so what I've done is I've taken this term here, uh, put on the right-hand side, and the z theta on the left-hand side. And what I've done is <clears throat> have integrated by parts uh, with the techniques you've already learned. So plus, minus, remove the derivative, increase the derivative by 1. And on this uh, second equation at the bottom here, uh, what I've done is um, multiply zw to this whole term here. This whole term is that term. The whole term has prime. Uh, so I took advantage of that. And so I wrote it here, removed the derivative, and rewrote it again. And then pass the prime over to this guy. Uh, so I'm splitting the order differentiation, and I'm sharing that derivative with ZW. So I'm, I'm basically lowering the continuity requirements and weakening the continuity requirements. That's why we're actually developing the waveform. Uh, and so I get plus, minus, right? So all you guys are familiar with this. I'm kind of sort of doing a summary, actually. Uh, this actually is sort of a summary of what we're covering with 1D. Uh, and so I chose Timoshenko to do the summary with, OK? Um, and so uh, if I went in and uh, um, uh, insert uh, the, so this times that it goes inside the integral, this times that goes inside the integral, uh, I put it back in there, uh, and I multiply the ZWs throughout uh, very quickly. Um, that's what I get for the uh, integrand. That's what I get for the integrand. And since I'm looking at a generic uh, domain, I went from xi to xj, but you know what I'm really trying to do. I'm trying to derive the element formulation. I haven't told you that yet, but that's really what we're doing. And so when I look at the boundary conditions, the boundary conditions I have uh, this times that, um, and I put that at the boundary, so that's evaluated at the boundary. And all the cross terms go to the boundary, remember that. So this term times that, <coughs> times that term uh, <coughs> goes to the boundary. Uh, and so now this, so, so for me to now know what are the essential boundary conditions, I told you what the trick should be. So I look at the boundary conditions, and I focus on the weight function, where the weight function shows up. It shows up there and shows up here. So I quickly notice that since z theta is a weight function, that theta must be, well, anything specified on theta must be an essential boundary condition. And then likewise with ZW, I see ZW shows up here. And so that I can interchange with W. Now, now I know that anything specified on W becomes an essential boundary condition. While anything specified on EI theta prime or anything specified on KGA minus the, theta x plus W prime is a natural boundary condition. So looking at that, now I know that these two quantities are essential boundary conditions. In order Bernoulli beam theory, however, what were the essential boundary conditions there? Sorry? W and W prime. That's what we got for essential boundary conditions there. And we knew that because we had, I was using a weight function of V there, if you go back. And so I had a V here, and I had a V prime here. But in this case, I don't have a V prime. I have ZW and Z theta. So I know that these are really the, the variables that for which if you specify those are the essential boundary conditions. Now when I go back to the example here for this beam with a transverse load, um, if I stare at this now that I know this new information, what here is the essential boundary condition? Yeah, we just say that dolin theta, anything specified on those at the boundaries becomes essential boundary condition. So these two are the essential boundary conditions. And anything specified on anything else becomes a natural boundary condition. It's very, very interesting to me that we started to two governing equations, OK? Two governing equations. We went in, integrated by parts to weaken the continuity requirements. And now I have boundary conditions that have physical meaning. It is actually quite mind boggling that that actually did happen. And, 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 and we can relate them to quantities that you apply at the boundaries. And we've seen that with heat transfer. 
we saw that we integrated by parts, and suddenly I have temperature uh, as the essential boundary condition. It came out naturally. And then, no pun intended, we also got natural boundary conditions that were heat flux. Heat flux, Q, derivative of T respect to X. Look it up. It's quite interesting that physics seems to want to tell us, hey, there is physics into what you're looking at. Unless when I make a problem up, like I've done in class, I've done a few problems like that where I have not been able to explain to you what they mean because I made it up, right? But for physics problems, t t seems to me, seems to me that when we do the weak, we develop the weak form from the government equation, those weak forms have physical meaning. And the reason is simple why they have physical meaning is because they connect with the functional, right? Which, if you minimize, you do get the weak form. So they're connected. They're all these, all these things are connected uh, very, very tightly. Okay, so uh, going back here to this problem here. So since the essential boundary conditions um, are theta and w for this problem, if they are specified, then if I were to develop an element, if I were to develop an element, what must be continuous across element boundaries then? Theta and w. I must have theta and w that that are continuous across element boundaries as I go from one element to another. You understand what I'm talking about? We've covered this, okay? And so, so if I want to use weak form Galerkin to, so this is a weak form, by the way, but if I want to use weak form Galerkin to actually formulate the element, now I'm primed, I'm ready to go to do this. Um, but before I do that, I want to expand these boundary conditions a little bit more to kind of simplify uh, what we're talking about here. So I did that here in the next page. I kind of expanded it out, uh, those boundary conditions. Uh, I kept a minus sign in front as much as I could, OK? Uh, so in turn, this one was a plus sign, but I made a minus minus. And the purpose of that is so that when I put all these terms to the other side of the equation, they're pluses. And so th just like with heat transfer and just like beam theory and bar theory, we did that is to keep consistency uh, so that you know what's positive, what is negative later on. So when I have a positive moment, I know exactly what I'm doing. I have positive force, I know exactly what I'm doing. That's the reason we do that. Um, now I note very quickly that this EI theta prime xj is basically the moment, um, is a moment uh, at one of the end nodes. Okay, so, so if I have xi and xj, basically this is the moment here. I thought I had a picture um, the picture was the next page, unfortunately, but you can see here Q4, that's a moment on the other end. Um, <clears throat> I also have minus EI theta prime XI at the, the first node. Uh, that one right there is this guy here, that's Q2, the moment on the other side, uh, the other node, I. Um, and then this is clearly shear. We covered that already. Doesn't this look, look like shear strain right here? So shear strain times shear modulus gives me what? Shear stress, shear stress times A gives me stress. So that's clearly stress, uh, 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 sorry, it doesn't give me stress, it gives me total force in the cross section, shear force. So that's clearly Q3, the force in a transverse direction, Q3, okay? And then finally we have uh, this one here, which is Q1. If I plug in uh, with the definitions of Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 into the weak form, uh, then I'm basically, what I'm doing there, by the way, when I do that, I'm imposing the natural boundary conditions. That's what I've, I'm just doing. I'm imposing these boundary conditions into the weak form. So when I do that, things look a lot more clean and simple. Um, minus theta, uh, minus z theta, minus z theta, and then minus z w and minus z w. Again, z w here is a weight function, and that weight function is evaluated at x i and xj, and again, zw is a weight function associated with a differential equation that had the high order derivative uh, of w in that one, okay? And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use this equation now to basically develop the element formulation uh, that, that we need to get to. So because theta, because theta and w need to be continuous across element boundaries, right? For each variable, for each variable, without looking too closely here, uh, what order differentiation do I need at a minimum? 
for, for each of them. It can be constant because if I plug in a constant for approximation function here, what happens? I get zero. If I put linear, can I do linear? Yeah, I can do linear. So, so you want to use the minimum differentiation, the, the polynomial with minimum, minimum differentiation first, right? With order Bernoulli beam, we had to have W and W prime to be continuous across element boundaries. So since it was a single variable and we have four different constraints to meet at two at each boundary, now I have to use a cubic polynomial. That's what we did. That's what we had to do that there. But here, theta and W are independent. They're independent from each other. So I can use a linear function for W, a linear function for theta. And for that reason, we'll do that. We'll use that. Uh, we already know how to do this. So um, we'll use a shape function matrix here, very quick. Uh, V1, theta1, V2, theta2, two, two degrees per node. So I'll use V1 for, for deflections, transverse deflections. And then theta1 for rotations at one node. And the other node as well, v, V2 and theta2. So if I multiply uh, this shape function matrix times V1, theta1, V2, theta2, you should get W and theta. Uh, you should retri retrieve that back. Uh, just to show you very quickly, um, W, let's evaluate W, okay? Let's assume this element goes from zero to L for a second, uh, which is what I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm not doing it in a very general manner. I'm not going from Xi to Xj. Let's just go from zero to L very quickly. So if I go zero to L, what is W at zero? So I plug in zero here, right? So that's one. What do I get there? Zero. So I have one, zero, zero, zero. If I multiply that by this column vector, I get V1, don't I? At the other end, so that's W at L, X equals L. Uh, when I plug it in here, what do I get? Zero. Zero, zero, I have one here and then zero there, right? So this first row times this column is basically zero, zero, one, zero. So it's enabling this V2 to come out. So I have V2 for that uh, end, which makes sense, it's, it's working out. Theta, the trick here for theta was that I, we staggered it. We put N1 to be the second value here, the fourth value here, that's on purpose. So when I multiply this vector, sorry, the second row by this column, the zero times V1 goes away. It doesn't show up. So it's a trick to kind of put in compact form. It's very convenient because if, if you're able to do this, now you can, uh, for 3D problems, it becomes even more convenient. If you can put everything in a matrix and it includes everything, all the bells and whistles you can solve a, a, a very difficult problem. Uh, but in this case, I chose to actually do old school, and I'll show you what I mean with that. Um, so, so now that I know the approximation function for W and theta, I selected them to be linear polynomials, and they're good polynomials because they, what, what, what about these polynomials? What, what makes it great? What, what makes the, this approximation function good for this problem? It basically, it, it, it satisfies the values of the ends, V1 and V2, right? We just demonstrated that by put, putting in there x equals 0 and x equals L, number one. Two, they're complete, linear independent, and also uh, the shape functions, these are basically basis functions. If you add this plus that, what do you get? One. So I get, I get partition unity, and also this satisfies Kronecker delta properties. You can check it, okay? So, so these, these approximation functions we're selecting are really good. Uh, now, what is my next step? Then all the approximation functions. Uh, by the way, that's a weak form. We haven't done anything special yet. What do I need to do now? <coughs> Sorry? Pl thank you very much. I take the approximation function for W and theta and plug it into my weak form. And then what do I select for my weight function? Somebody else. What do I select for my weight function? I select each of my basis functions, right? Okay, and how many basis functions do I have? Four. I really have four. How many unknowns do I have? Four. What are the unknowns? 
V1 theta 1, V2 theta 2, which is this vector right here. That's a vector of unknowns. And, and if I have four equations for unknowns, now I can go ahead and, and, and basically assemble my global stiffness matrix and force vector and all that, all, all the goodies, okay? So now that I've, I've demonstrated that very quickly, let's substitute, let's substitute, I'm gonna go through each equation, okay? Let's go to the first equation. So the first equation, I went in and substituted the value for theta one. This is the value for theta one. It was theta one prime, and that's why you see n one prime theta one plus n two prime theta two. And for, and for uh, this was also minus theta, remember? This used to be minus theta. I plugged in the value for theta, which is n one theta plus n two theta. I see some blank faces, so let me remind you what theta is. So theta is n one times theta one plus n two times theta two. What we're doing is substituting these equations into these approximation functions into uh, the weak form, okay? So that's why you see that. And then if you remember, this was W prime, remember? So theta plus, minus theta plus W prime. So for W prime, I have N1 prime V1 plus N2 prime V2. Just substitution, substituting the approximation function in. Uh, for my first equation, I chose a basis function, uh, the first one. I just chose N1, okay? Which corresponds really, I, I, I chose it to be for z theta. So I put z, for z theta, I set it to n1, okay? Now, zw, because this first equation does not involve zw, I made it zero. So this is zero and zero, okay? So again, the first equation, uh, we're just focusing on z theta. I could have done zw first, but I set it to z theta first uh, to enable that one first. Uh, so when I do z theta, for z theta, I selected n1 to be my first basis function. Uh, for the rest, uh, for zw, which was here and here, just to remind you, that's where zw was. zw was there and there. I'm basically making those zero and just focusing on z theta for now. Again, there's two equations there. Um, so when I do that, and then now, you also quickly realize that uh, this will become one. The shift function is one at that node, isn't it? Right? So if I plug in here, um, the, if I take n1, v for n1, sorry, theta for n1, what do I get? Z, for z theta, I chose n1. n1 evaluated at node, the first node, x equals zero, is basically one. And it's zero at the other node, which is that one. And then this one has zw's. So I'm making those zero because we're not dealing with that equation yet. Okay, so that's my first equation. The second equation, I'm gonna select ZW, which was right here. The same, I'm plugging, I plug in the approximation functions for theta and W, I already plugged them in. The only thing I'm switching now is the basis function, the weight function. Now I'm selecting the weight function to be the second basis function, which is a shape function, N2. That's the only difference between this one and that one. Um, but now, when I do that, uh, you will see here that I get a zero at this node, one at that node. That makes sense because N2, is, isn't N2 at this node I zero for Kronecker delta property? But N2 at node J is one, right, by Kronecker delta property. These two are zero because we're not enabling ZW yet. We're not enabling they've got the, the weight function that goes along the second equation here, okay? Again, I could have done this in two separate equations to make it easier for you to see, and I did that in one of my previous lectures. I'm just trying to show you how to do it when everything is together in one equation. So you see a different perspective. Um, the third equation, the third equation, we're gonna disable this top equation, z theta now, I'll make a zero, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna focus now on the second equation, uh, which has ZW, remember that? So for the first weight function, I'll select N1, so I get N1 prime and N1. This was Z theta here, if you recall, I mean, disabling those. Uh, and then I have Z theta, ZW there, and ZW there, okay. For ZW, what I selected? N1, okay? And since I selected N1, uh, so then N1 at node i is one, that makes sense. 
at node J0, Kronecker delta property. Then again, I went to the fourth equation, uh, did the same thing. Disabled uh, the first equation because now we're focusing on ZW. The second wave function, I selected ZW to be N2. And uh, again, you see here that uh, due to Kronecker delta property, N2 here at node I is zero, but node J is one. Okay, so I have my four equations. I'm done. Four equations and four unknowns. But now I need to put in matrix notation because I have a V1, V2, theta1, theta2 everywhere. I want to make it nice in, in a matrix format. Uh, that's what I did. Uh, I put in matrix format. It looks like this. A uh, little bit messy. I agree. Um, and, uh, but uh, there you have it. Nothing to be, you know, you don't have to fear anything. Uh, it's just what it is. It's four by four. Uh, you, you can see here KGA shows up. You have EI there. These shape functions, N1 and N2, are the same for both approximation functions. Remember, we're not changing those. We're using the same approximation functions for W and theta. Okay? Uh, but all you have to do is evaluate this in Mathematica, integrate it. I should have put here 0 to L since I actually chose my shape functions to go from 0 to L. Uh, so if you can take a note, we'll correct that. 0 to L there. Um, and then I have uh, uh, my load vector here, uh, which comes out naturally to, to look like this, uh, plus my force vector, my internal, for, internal force vector. Uh, but these are distributed, they're the distributed loads. Okay? And uh, when I evaluate this in Mathematica, this is what I get. This is my stiffness matrix that I will get. Okay? And just keep that in mind because uh, we'll come back to this again. Okay? Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Sorry? What is the Q1, Q2, Q3? So these are, these are the, this Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 are the internal forces in the element. Are, they're basically uh, the ones here. Just like in bar theory, just like in Euler Bernoulli beam theory, just like even in heat transfer where we had Q going in one end and Q in the other end, right? Those, you're going to go and assemble, when you assemble the whole stiffness matrix, you're going to be able to assemble also the global forces, uh, and they will take over these quantities. Okay, we we cover that. Just go back and review. If not clear, we'll we'll come back to that. Okay. All right. So four equations, uh, four unknowns for one element. What happens? Just a, as, as a as a this is a good final exam oral oral question. Um, what happens when I when I invert this? Sorry? Can I invert this? Well, I can, but it will be singular, right? It's a singular matrix. Why? Why? And, and physically, what's happening? Why is it singular? I think I'm applying in boundary conditions, so it's floating in the air if I apply any loads. Or there's no unique solution, basically. Physically, that's what it relates to. Okay. Um, all right. So there you go. That's that's your element formulation. Timoshenko element formulation. So now let's look at it from a different perspective. Let's, let's use um, total potential energy. What about if we use total potential energy? Again, I'm using today's lecture to sort of re-review the concepts we covered. That's one goal. Second goal is to teach you Timoshenko beam because I have to do that. And third goal is to show you how to deal with two equations. That are, you basically have two equations, okay? So I have several goals here. And my fourth goal is to show you that not everything is perfect in life. And I'll, I'll get to that when, 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 when I get there. You will see that uh, this actually, this, this formulation actually is not very, very robust. And when I get there, you will see it. Um, so when I, when I start with the total potential energy, all, all, all of you should recall that we started with the total potential energy, the strain energy, plus the potential energy of the low supply. Okay, so the strain energy was basically one half the stress in one direction times epsilon n xx plus one half sigma yy times epsilon yy and so forth. If you go back and look at that lecture, but since the only non-zero strains are epsilon xx and epsilon xz, the rest of them are zero. Those don't contribute to the strain energy uh, of the functional here pi. Okay, and uh, for the distributive force. 
That's the total potential energy. That makes sense. That's a load applied P, uh, the work done by a load applied P moving through a deflection W, uh, total sense. But now that's on a differential M and dx, right? So basically, the, the total work done is the integral uh, over uh, that quantity. And then these ones are easy to define as work done because it's Q, the force Q1, uh, moving through the deflection V1. That's the work done. Isn't, isn't the work done the force times how much it moves? Yeah, so that's basically what we're talking about there. Minus Q3 times V2. And then I have the moments that go along with the rotations. Okay, Beautifully done. Now, guess what? Guess what happens when I minimize this total potential energy? I will not do it here today. But what do I get when I minimize the total potential energy? Sorry? You guys didn't do the exam yet? I think that it wasn't the exam due like a week ago. What happens when you minimize the total potential energy? You get the weak form. I'm not going to do it here, but I'll give you, uh, for some of you that are, uh, you know, maybe lagging a little bit, I'll give you 20 points if you prove that, that when you minimize the total potential energy, using the formula I showed you before, that you get, you get this as a weak form, that you get this, OK? Um, and I already showed you the formula, on, uh, the formula that you need to use to, to do that. Um, uh, but I, I have great faith you'll be able to do it. And if you don't know how to start, Come to me at the end of the lecture or Leonardo, and then we'll, we'll guide you through what you need to do. Okay? I'm not going to do that here. That's, that's not what I want to do. But I, I do think you should do it. So you can see, you can see that the governing equation, the weak form, and the total potential energy are all interconnected. And because physics works, but, you know, left and right and right and left, that what I will get using this formulation is going to be the same element formulation as what I got using the weak form, starting from the strong form. Am I starting with the governing equation here? No, I'm starting with total potential energy. In fact, this has no knowledge right here. What I wrote here, this pure energy, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's connected to the governing equations. But I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that, right? I'm going to show you that just starting from energy principles, we'll get to the end result that is consistent with uh, starting, starting with the strong form and going to the, down the weak form path. Okay? Are the concepts connecting to you? Or I mean, I gave you an exam that I thought connected all these dots. I gave you a homework that did the same thing. And so what we want to do is instill in you a, a clear understanding of these concepts. You know, even for even for heat transfer, uh, you can make the connection, I, and I showed you that connection. And I believe the exam was a cable, right? We made the connection there as well. Okay, so so hopefully you're seeing how things connect together, and how they harmonize to get you to the same answer. Um, can I use the total potential energy in all situations? What situations I cannot use it in? non-conservative systems. I'm going to start to have to use a different way to get there. OK, so I know the constitutive law. I know how stress relates to strain. I know how stress relates to strain because it's basically kg gamma, the shear engineering strain, uh, and then shear, uh, young modulus times axial strain. So I know these formulas. I'll just go in and plug them in here. So well, I didn't plug them in yet, but um, Oh, also, I know the strain relationships for this theory. Uh, so I can calculate the, sh the strains that are associated with these displacement assumptions, which I already showed you that are consistent. They make sense for Timoshenko. I already showed you. Uh, we, we graphically showed you that, um, and, and it, it seems to work out. So when I plug in uh, the, um, the, the shear, the strain, displacement relationships uh, into these uh, stress strain relationships, which I can do very quickly because sigma xx is e times epsilon xx. And so epsilon xx is this, so I can plug it in. Sigma xz is kg times gamma, or the engineering strain, which I have calculated as 
minus theta times w prime x. I can plug it in there quickly. You see that? Fairly quick. Um, so I can do that. So let me plug this now into the total potential energy. Uh, when I do that, uh, I plug it in. I get this term squared. OK, I think I have a, a problem here. Uh, if we can take a note, this sigma xx does not go here. OK, that's an error. Because I substituted what sigma xx is already, which is e times minus z e times theta prime x. OK, so I substituted that there. And so this should not have shown up. So that's squared. And then I, I get this kg squared, basically. OK. Can you see how I got there? Yeah? If you don't follow and you don't track, do it inversely in your head. What is sigma? Quickly. What is sigma? E times epsilon. So then I get E times epsilon squared. What is epsilon? Epsilon is this. So Z theta prime squared. That's what you see there. And then you can do it inversely here too. Sigma XZ is twice epsilon XZ. Well, what is sigma XZ? Sigma XZ is KGA, sorry, KG times strain epsilon XZ. So then I get basically KG times epsilon XZ squared, and epsilon XZ is given here. So I get KG times that squared. That's another way to look at it inversely, you know, but you still get the same answer. Now, let, let's look at these uh, relationships very carefully. I want to guide you through this one, for example. Does this depend on Z? No, they don't depend on Z. Uh, and actually, they don't, they don't depend on Y in the, in, the, in the thickness of the beam, in the other direction, the width. It does not depend on Y either, right? So this DA actually becomes, don't you think, becomes basically area, K, KGA, basically? So that's what I have there, KGA, OK? Now, this one here, uh, E and theta don't depend on x. you agree? Yeah? And because E and theta don't depend, and just pretend C max x is not there. That was a mistake. So E and theta do, do not depend on the cross-sectional area. Makes sense. I mean, the module is not changing through the thickness, or through the width, I'm sorry. Uh, and also, uh, they're not changing through the thickness either. So theta prime and E are constant in the cross section. So therefore, uh, I can take that as a coefficient and now have z squared. What is the integral of z squared dA? Moment of inertia. So that's where the i comes from. Okay. Now everything is a function of dx. Sorry, everything is a function of x and the integrand, the integral is just dx here. Because I already took care of dA the, there. Remember, I had the volume there. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Any questions so far? You, you follow what we're doing here? I've taken the total potential energy, which you can derive it at home very quickly, or I gave you the formula actually for that. And you can plug in the strain displacement relationship into the constitutive law and use the constitutive law to plug it in into the total potential energy. So that the total potential energy is just a function of, of displacements or unknowns. What are the, the only unknowns that you see here actually is W and theta. Okay? So we made it just a function of that. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So this is a question you're going to go home and try to minimize if you want the extra points. Okay? So now, what is my next step? What is my next step? Sorry? I want to derive the element formulation using total potential energy. If you remember from the Riley Ritz, what I will do is put in the approximation function for each of the variables of interest into the total potential energy and minimize the total potential energy relative to the unknowns, right? This is what we, we did. Very simple process. Uh, we're going to do that today. Okay. Um, but I'm going to do some tricks <laughs> because I want to do it differently from what I did in weak form. Just to show you different ways of doing it that are a little bit quicker than what I did earlier. What I did earlier was actually messy and took too many steps. Okay? So I'm just trying to give you different perspectives on how to go about this. Uh, so we know that W and theta must be continuous across element boundaries. Uh, we already have uh, shown that um, what interpolation functions will you use for W and theta, okay? Um, but I'm going to turn this into a 
something a little bit different. I'm going to turn this into a matrix format, and I'm doing that on purpose. So if you notice here, um, I can actually call E bold to be this quantity here. Okay, I'll call it that. And if you actually took this E bold and made it E transpose times that matrix times E bold, if you multiply this at home, if you multiply this at home, you get this equation back. Actually. Some of you are like smiling, like this is cool. Well, because if, if, if you do everything in matrix format, everything is going to be quicker. Remember, finite elements is about putting things into matrices uh, and, and so let, you know, come, come up with a systematic approach, right? And so if I can make it into matrices, then I can quickly get to a formulation. Some of you also have blank faces. Some of you are smiling. So for the ones with the blank faces, if I multiply this row, okay, if I multiply this times this matrix and I multiply it by that, you, what, these are constants, basically, diagonal. So what you really get is d squared, uh, times EI plus D squared times KGA, which is exactly what we have here. But if, if you're really, really concerned about what I just did here, you can also do it at home. Okay? Or you can just simply use visualization in your head. You know, this is E bold. E bold transpose is basically now a row, right? This becomes a row. So the first row, right, times a column basically gives me theta prime times EI. You agree? Okay, and now I have uh, the first row, which is a transpose of that, minus theta x, dolly prime x, times the second column is kga times that. So now I have a, a, a row times this column, and that's going to give you this square. Just try it at home, and you'll see it's going to work out. Okay. Uh, I'll give you half point extra credit if you try that. <laughs> I will not give you a lot of points for that, okay? Um, all right. Enough of that. We, we put the problem in a way that I think is going to be very powerful. And so let's look at E-Bowl now. So actually, let's not look at E-Bowl now. Let's look at how to approximate theta and delta. So I'll go back to what we've done before. I already showed you this. We're going to use a linear approximation because uh, is, is if I go back to my total potential energy, I look at my total potential energy, uh, I have a prime there. So I cannot use a constant for approximation. That doesn't work out constant prime of that is zero. It goes away. So if I use a linear approximation, a linear approximation is excellent because now the prime of that is a constant. I can use that there. Okay. I also want to draw your attention a little bit very quickly. We're going to bring this up a little bit later in a very important topic. Um, but if I put theta here, what do I get for a function? A linear function. If I put a linear function here, what do I get? A constant. So I have a constant times a linear function. So it didn't blow up, nothing happened there of concern. So I can use a linear function here, okay? But keep that in mind, this, this particular point I just made now is gonna become more important later, okay? Um, so uh, we all agree these, these approximation functions will work, linear interpolation. Um, these functions uh, actually do work, uh, they satisfy uh, this basis function satisfy partition, partition unity, current or delta, and again, they allow us to use unknown coefficients that are at the node, rather than unknown coefficients that you did not know what they meant before, if you remember back from your homeworks, okay? Um, so now I'll use this, and I'm going to do something really, really clever, actually, which I did not invent, so I will not take credit for this, uh, but uh, I can rewrite E bold so that it relates directly to the nodal quantities, okay? And, and it, it sounds incredibly difficult, but it's not that hard, okay? All you have to do to accomplish that is I know, is the way I look at this matrix here that relates E bold, which is this column here, to these nodal quantities, I view it as a transfer function. It's basically a transfer function. How that strain, I call this strain maybe, or, or some quantity like strain, I relate, and this is really strain. These are the curvatures, and this is shear strain. So these are really quantities that have to do with strains. I'm basically looking for a transfer function that relates strains to deflections. 
at the or, or or unknown quantities at the nodes. Now I want I want to see if everybody agrees with me that theta prime in fact is n1 prime times theta 1 plus n2 prime times theta 2. Does everybody agree? Yeah, I mean, th isn't theta n1 times theta 1 plus n2 times theta 2? Yeah, so then theta prime is n1 prime times theta 1, n2 prime times theta 2. These zeros don't come into play times v2 because this matrix was actually developed in a very unique way to actually give you zero when you multiply it by that. So V1 and V2 did not show up. So it was, it was constructed intelligently to, to allow for that. So when I look at the second equation, because these are equations, by the way. It's just a different way of writing it. So it's, it's you know, I put it in matrix form and people freak out. But a matrix is just an equation. A bunch of the equations, you put in them in a compact manner. Okay. Um, so the second equation here, you realize I have minus theta x plus w prime x. I want to see if you agree with me that multiplying this row times this column, in fact, gives me minus theta plus w prime x. Keeping in mind that theta x is n1 theta 1 plus n2 theta 2, and w x is n1 times v1 plus n2 times v2. <coughs> Keeping that in mind, let's see if that's the case. So. I have minus theta x. Let's start with this term and see if when I multiply this row times that column, let's see if I can get minus theta x. So I get n1 prime times v1. I want to deal with that v1 here. Let's, let's keep that aside. Minus n1 times theta1 plus n2 prime times v2. Keep that aside for a second. So I have minus n1 times theta1 minus n2 times theta2. Isn't that minus theta x, the contribution to minus theta x? Yes? Everybody in the back, you follow? So if I look at W prime x now, the next contribution, I get n1 prime times v1, and then I get n2 prime times v2. Isn't what W prime is? So in fact now, I have a transfer function that takes me from the nodal values to the strains in the element and any point within the element in a very compact manner. The reason that's so powerful is because you know why. <laughs> I will call this B now, bold B, right? We'll call it bold B there. We'll call this D bold, and D bold is really what I'm looking for. And I'm going to trick the system. Because now I know E in a very compact manner, B bold times D. And so all I have to do is plug this in here into my total potential energy here at the bottom. So when I do that, when I do that, I, I plug this in here. Uh, I just substitute E bold transpose. I get D transpose B bold because E bold is B bold D. So I just do that. And then for E, I get B bold D. And then for W, I have to be careful. I have N1 and N2 because I don't have contributions uh, in, in uh, the thetas. Okay? And then I have the Q vector, the, the bold Q vector times D transpose. If I minimize pi with respect to each of the unknown coefficients, I already showed you multiple times, it's basically getting rid of the D transpose altogether. And if I do that, if I minimize pi with respect to D, then I get this as the element formulation, okay? In a very compact manner, much more cleaner actually than weak form. Weak form it wasn't that clean the way I did it, okay? But now I can use Mathematica, and you know me. I'm going to do it in three steps, maybe four. So let's do that. I did it in Mathematica, define the shape functions. I defined that B bold matrix in very few steps. Um, constitutive law is a matrix two by two, EI zero zero KGA. Full simplify, integrate, transpose B bold times D, the stiffness matrix, times B bold, integrate from zero to L, and bam, stiffness matrix. And then I integrated the load vector, and I got the load vector. And this matches the weak form, what I got through the weak form. So this is exactly the same thing I got earlier. So notice how I said with the strong form, I went down to the weak form, I approximated this, the behavior over an ele element, and then I got an element stiffness matrix, okay? And now I saw the total potential energy in this second half, right? So total potential energy, then 
approximated the behavior over an element using Riley Ritz, basically, and I got an element stiffness matrix that matches a completely different approach because physics works. That's why. Okay. Uh, and I have the total vector, force vector here. This force vector makes sense because if I add up PL over 2 times 1 plus PL over 2 times 1 for a uniform, this is actually for a very uh, specific case, uniform distributed force. I wanted to do it so I can check this out. So PL over 2 times 1 plus PL over 2 times 1 is P, P uh, times L, the total force. That makes sense. If I have a distributed force over the element of an amount P, the length of the element times that P gives me a total force acting transverse to that element. Okay. Now, because I, I want to keep uh, boring you a little bit here, we're going to try isoparametric formulation now on this. Okay. So uh, that's what I did here. I tried isoparametric formulation. I have uh, now I have to define a coordinate that maps out uh, any coordinate where my element is. So it goes from minus 1 to 1. What were the benefits of that? What was the benefit of mapping um, an element so it goes from minus 1 to 1? Sorry? Sorry? Numerical integration is one reason. Another reason? Same shape functions. Another reason? The derivatives of the shape functions are the same for every element. Are we forgetting? You have a homework due this Thursday. I, I, okay, hold on. Okay. All right, that's the, uh, we're going to relate the general elements uh, to a, a, an element that goes from minus one to one for the reasons we talked about. Uh, and so now my shape functions now look very simple. Uh, they go from, uh, for W, I get 1 minus C divided by 2, 1 plus Z divided by 2. For the rotation, I have 1 minus Z divided by 2, 1 plus Z divided by 2. Okay. So just as before, but now now uh, I'm writing things in terms of um, C now. So they go from minus 1 to 1. Uh, so nothing different from before. Um, the only difference is that these derivatives now are respect to X. You agree? Yeah. And, but now my ends are dependent on C, not X. So now I have to figure out how to do that. So I'll use chain rule. We cover that chain rule, right? Remember? And the chain rule allows me, allows me to calculate this even though N depends on C. I can actually calculate N respect to X by doing chain rule. Okay? And we already covered that the rate of X, which we, we know what the rate of X respect to C is for a linear, linear uh, interpolation. Uh, but but uh, we call this J, basically. So if I know this J, I can solve for this term, and so I get this times 1 over J. And that's what you see here uh, for the first shape function and for the second shape function. Uh, I did that. Um, I did the calculation. So I put it in here directly. Uh, the rate of N1 is to C J inverse. Okay, And so I just put it in here. Uh, as you see. And you can see that here some of them don't have it, and that's because there's no primes, right? I didn't have to take that derivative. Um, if you've calculated J for this problem, you will get this L over 2. You can find that very quickly, and we did that in previous lectures, so I don't want to repeat that again. But um, since I have J inverse, then get 2 over L, and 2 over L, and so forth. So I just calculate all of that, uh, just worked it out. Um, and so now, this is true for every element, except now the L. I have the geometry inserted there, but that's not a big deal. If you know the element length, you know B bold. Now that I have that, actually, I did the calculation here. I didn't think I did it, but the, the root of x, which was C, also needs to be calculated to replace the dx that was there for a deep C. So, so then I have this chain rule, dash j, and that j is L over 2. So I'm going to replace dx to be L over 2 times deep C. So that's that. And now this B bold uh, R um, is given here, uh, right there. Um, everything else stays the same, but now my integrals go from minus 1 to 1, just like that. Okay. Uh, the calculations, again, were performed in Mathematica. 
a data in Mathematica, uh, specify n so that n1 is 1 minus z divided by 2, n2 is 1 plus z divided by 2, and then I continue it on and on just like before. But my integrals go from minus 1 to 1. And when you calculate all this, and don't forget this dx, I replace it by L over 2. Okay? And uh, I get the same, the same stiffness matrix as I did with the regular formulation. So now I've done it three different ways. Uh, the last two are more, of course, they're much more tightly um, related. Uh, but we've done it three times now. Uh, all right, so enough is enough. This uh, force, distributed force here is for, for constant transverse load. So it's a special case. If you have a triangular force, you get a different answer here. Okay, um, now let's cover something that, that uh, we need to really talk about now which is a problem, problem with this element. Um, but before I talk about that, I want to draw your attention to this B-bold matrix. This B-bold matrix has C in there, remember? You see that? If I put B-bold there, B transpose, that has, that has a linear function of C. This has a function of C. So when I multiply everything, what is the higher order polynomial I'll get, the highest order? Quadratic, because I'll have linear here and then linear here, so I get quadratic polynomial. So how many integration points should I use to, to evaluate that integral exactly? Two. Two points. Okay? We covered that in, in, the, in last week. So go back and review that. Uh, so two-point quadrature will integrate this exactly. Now, of course, I did it in Mathematica, and I got the answer, right? Mathematica did it for me, because you can integrate a quadratic polynomial in no time. Uh, but uh, I wanted to bring this attention in terms of quadrature, uh, because we're going to talk about this a little bit more now. Okay, so one of the issues with this element um, is the following: if I use two integration points, which will give me the exact solution, by the way, will give me the exact solution. If I let's say I so chose an element about here, okay, I chose an element about there, it goes minus one to one. I map it to minus one to one, and uh, and I have two, two, two uh, interpolations, right? One for V, one for theta. You agree? So remember that, that the sampling points are minus 0.577 or 1 over squared over 3. Remember, minus 1 over squared over 3. And the weight functions that go along with that, the weight for the integrands are 1 for each of them. Uh, so that I get this as the sampling points. Um, all you notice that uh, for W, for W, um, I basically have, I could have either a constant or you could have V1 or V2 to be different, doesn't matter. The point is that I have this here, okay? I have an interpolation for each, V and W, and I'm, I'm basically sampling on those guys. Uh, when I look at the number of elements uh, for a thick beam, uh, for a thick beam, um, the finite element solution divided by the exact solution for two-point Gaussian quadrature, two points, which gives me the exact, you should match the exact. Um, for one element, I'm off. I increase the number of elements, and I get better. So I'm getting better. WFEM is getting better to W exact. That makes sense. The more elements I have, the closure I should get to the solution. The problem is when I look at thin beams. When I have a very thin beam, very thin beam, I, I see a problem here. I increase the number of elements, but things are not really improving. I mean, the error is huge. The FEM solution is a fraction of what the exact solution should be. And I increase the number of elements from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, and it's not helpful. It's not going anywhere. Okay? And it's mind-boggling because Timoshenko should have worked. <laughs> it should have worked for a long beam. I told you that. I told you Timoshenko should be a good theory for long beams and short beams. Yet, this is not what this is showing me. It's not what's telling me, okay? And so when we explore what, what was going on here, um, we need to explain this issue because something is definitely wrong with this theory, with the way we're doing things. Um, and when we explore more carefully, let me divide this by EI, this total potential energy. I'll divide this by EI all across. And then I'll see here that I have kg A over EI and I have P over EI and this one's over EI. Let's ignore this for a second because the one that we need to really invert 
is a stiffness matrix we have, which has KG, A, or EI. And in fact, uh, when we look back at the weak form, the st stiffness matrix, we got the weak form. This is what we got. We have uh, EI over KGA, but in fact, you will have something similar there uh, when you invert it, okay? So going back here, uh, not to lose your attention, what I want to draw your attention to is that this, this term here um, has this KG over EI, okay? Uh, when I come calculate what KG over EI is, um, I realize uh, when I, I is inertia for a cross section is rectangular cross section is one over 12 bh cubed. I substitute everything there for an example, and then I get 12 kg e h squared. And what I quickly realize is that one h becomes very small, which is the thickness of the beam. What's happening to this ratio? Can somebody tell me what's happening to this ratio when h becomes? Very, very small, say? Or when h becomes close to zero, what's happening? This, huh? I can't hear. When h becomes small, what happens to this ratio? It, it wants to approach a very large number. It wants to give you a huge number, OK? Uh, so this, this integrand now wants to blow up because when h becomes small, you have that ratio that's approaching a very large number. And so the only way the finite element solution has to resolve this issue is to counteract it. It's going to say, well, if you're going to blow up that number, this must be zero. I'm going to have to make that zero to make it work. Well, that makes sense. That, that's correct, actually, because for a thin beam, for a thin beam, right, that's very long, how does, how does this element should behave? Like who? No, sh thank you so much, man. It should be have like order Bernoulli beam, which has no transfer shear. So it's doing the right thing. This wants to blow up. This wants to approach zero to be able to counteract that. And, and, and in fact, that's correct because you're correct. You know, for a thin beam, I should not have much of a transfer shear, which is what that t quantity is. That's transfer shear. Okay, so. So there's a, this is a problem, okay? That's what the total potential energy wants to do, okay? But let's look at the interpolation functions we selected. We selected a linear interpolation uh, for W and a linear interpolation for theta. If I use a linear interpolation for W, what is W prime? Constant. So I get constant there. And then for theta, I have a linear interpolation, okay? So the derivative of the deflection it's a piecewise constant across each element. Fine, no problem with that. Uh, but it coincides with a linear function from element to element, a, a linear function for theta from element to element. And so if I need to enforce a clamp boundary condition, okay, now I have to somehow deal with the fact that I have a constant value for this and then a linear function for that. They're not compatible. Okay, if you added these two for a clamp condition, adding this plus that will not really give you zero. Okay, it's not going to allow you to give you zero for a thin beam, and so now you have an issue. You have an issue that you have to resolve somehow, and and it, you know so the TPE is forcing you to get this to zero, but then the interpolation functions I selected are not allowing me to to enforce that condition quickly. Um, and so when I look at, uh, and this is a repeat of the previous slide, uh, but with a different set of lenses. Now you know a little more what's going on. This is constant now. The derivative of W is constant now from element to element. And, but theta ha is, has a linear distribution. If I add a constant times a linear distribution, I'm basically getting, uh, um, I'm not going to get a, 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 a zero value for sure. I'm not going to get that. Uh, in fact, if I have constant derivative, I may even get some, some amount of zero deflection, potentially, okay, because of this. Uh, and now you can see why here I have values that for FEM for thin beams are not getting close to even the exact solution. So how do we deal with this? How we deal with this, uh, and by the way, this is uh, from another book, 
uh, zinc here, which and Taylor. Uh, in this case, uh, they also show that. They show that uh, with two-point quadrature, it matches exact solution really well, really well. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the two-point solution, the two-point quadrature, which is the exact solution using FEA, uh, is not matching the exact solution. That should have gotten for very long beams. These are long beams here, okay? So not getting there. That's just to point out. So the main issue is that the deflection, if we look at the bottom of the issue, the bottom line of the issue is that the deflection and rotation of the cross-section uh, do not have compatible interpolation. That's the bottom. That's why that's happening. Um, and therefore, it is not possible because of this inconsistency in interpolation between this here, which is linear, and this one, which is constant, because I, I chose linear for W, so derivative of W is constant. Constant plus linear does not allow me to get to zero. That's why that's happening. And this effect is called shear locking, shear locking. Um, I'm going to continue here, and I'll take your question towards the end, because I want to make sure we cover this. But shear locking is the behavior that does not allow you to, basically the behavior becomes too stiff of that beam. Uh, and so uh, in this case it's called shear locking because it's a shear term causing this problem. Okay? So there's two approaches that people have used to circumvent this problem. The first one is called a higher order interpolation. So we're going to use a higher order for W. We can do that. What if I use a quadratic function for W? What happens now? What do I get for derivative for W? Linear. Now that linear function is consistent with theta, which is also linear. So actually that's a good idea because now I have consistent interpolation. Now I can potentially be able to replicate a zero shear strain for long beams. Okay. Uh, another approach that people have used is called reduced integration. What about if instead of integrating with two points, I just integrate with one point? So let's use a less accurate integration scheme to see if we can do a good job. Basically, that's what we're saying here. And that's why this is called an engineering approach because it's not, you know, it doesn't sound mathematically uh, rigorous, but um, but let's see what happens, uh, you know, with, with that. So if instead of using two Gauss quadrature points, I used a one-point quadrature point, which we'll call reduced integration. And I don't know if you recall, but uh, Leonardo walked us through a problem where he actually selected a reduced integration element. Okay? We didn't discuss at that point why we are doing it. But uh, what I want to point out to you is that a reduced integration element with one point, you're basically sampling the rotation at one point in a domain. Do you agree? In the center, actually, at zero. Remember? So for two points, it was 1 over square root of 3, 1 over square root of 3. Right? right? That's for two points. For one point, the sampling occurs right at the center. C equals 0. Excellent. Well, if I sample at one point, I can only do a good job integrating that integral to a, 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 a constant or linear function, okay? I cannot do a quadratic function. In essence, what I'm telling the code to do is I'm enforcing that rotation to be constant. I'm basically saying I want that rotation to act like a constant. So now this theta acts like a constant in my integration scheme. W prime was linear interpolation, right? W was a linear inter interpolation, so W prime is what? Constant. So now constant, constant, that, that's more compatible now. So I, I sort of kind of fudged it a little bit with one point integration. And when I do the integral in mathematica with one point, this is the integral I get. Okay? And sorry, this is the stiffness I get. And if I now do a one point integration, I'm sampling right at the center. So now this this point, does this point know that this behaving linear or cubic? No, this point thinks that, oh, everything's fine and dandy over here and here. It's probably constant. It doesn't know. And this W prime is constant for sure. That, that's constant. So, so when I go in and, 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 I, and I use this approach, this one point, which is strange, right? I'm reducing, I'm basically reducing 
I, I'm reducing the, the, the accuracy. I'm saying I'm going to integrate this less accurate. And yet, when I look at for a thin beam, bam, it matches the exact solution. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, this, this works out. And for thick beam, almost very similar convergence, both of them, thick and thin. Uh, so, this Timoshenko beam now, uh, you know, we started with an element that, you know, had experienced some shear locking problems. And, and it's interesting. We satisfy the convergence requirements. We satisfy completeness requirements. We satisfy uh, partition unity, chronicle delta, rigid body, str constant strain, strain rates, str strain, constant strains, okay? We satisfy all those things. The shape functions were linearly independent from each other. They're complete. We, what else can we could have done better? And then yet we got a shear locking problem. And that's because of the inconsistent interpolation between theta and W prime, okay? And we're able to resolve that by using a one point integration scheme instead of two points. And the one point integration scheme does not know that theta is is, is linear, so it just uses a constant value, basically. And so when I do that, I get very, very nice results, okay? Now, that, uh, with that said, uh, while this is not a rigorous approach, there's two other rigorous approaches. Uh, one rigorous approach is called consistent interpolation uh, for avoiding the shear locking problem. Or another approach could be to use reduced integration, but that's the engineering approach which logically makes sense. Um, but consistent interpolation basically uses quadratic approximation for the transverse deflection. So you have a middle node now in that element that tracks that deflection, transverse deflection. And you will have a linear approximation for rotation. That makes perfect sense because now theta plus W prime, or sorry, W prime minus theta prime, that combination gives you shear uh, that, that has the same order polynomial, okay? And now, uh, this one will converge very well and will actually approach the exact solution very quickly. Another one, another uh, um, approach is called super, super convergent element. Uh, it's called super convergent element because you use a Lagrange, a cubic polynomial for the transverse deflection, so two interior nodes uh, for the deflection. And for the rotation, we use a quadratic um, for the rotation with one intermediate point. And so now, again, I have consistent interpolation between W prime and theta in my shear term. And, and, and by doing so, uh, in fact, these, these cubic polynomials and quadratic polynomials, are, all they're doing actually, they're enforcing the exact solution directly into the element. That's why it converges maybe with just one element or few elements. That's why it's called superconvergent, because you use this and you, got, you basically get an exact solution right away, basically. Uh, but this is computationally expensive. This one is less computationally expensive. And the first approach, really quick, because now I'm evaluating just at one point. Just one point. That's actually a very quick uh, scheme, OK? Hey, it works. So why not use that? And that's why Abacus and other codes have a reduced integration to, uh, to basically address these problems of shear locking, okay? Um, so if we go to, just so you see, I'm not you know, making stuff up that I'm actually teaching in reality. I took the abacus manual and I did a print screen to show you the shear correction factor for various cross sections. It gives you those numbers so you're aware of them. Um, and it tells you for rectangular beam, uh, Cross-section is 0.85. I believe that's close to 5 over 6. We can check that. Um, and uh, it will give you, for different cases, what the shear correction factor is. Uh, and then the Timoshenko shear flexible, we already covered that, you know, gives you shear flexibility. Uh, beams are B21, B22, B31, and so forth. So it tells you what kinds of elements they, they, they can be. Um, I believe that two men, 2D space, and then one means the interpolation scheme, you know. Uh, and then same here, okay? This is quadratic, basically. Uh, this one will probably be less propensity to locking for thin beams. 
So this is Timoshenko beans allows for transfer shear uh, deformation. They can be used for thick uh, as well as slender beams. This isn't that what I told you. Uh, for beams made from uniform materials, shear flexible beam theory can provide useful results for cross-section dimensions up to one-eighth of typical axial distances. Uh, so, excellent. That's what we covered here. Um, all right. We also covered the assumptions of the transfer shear behavior of Timoshenko beam, and we said that that behavior is independent of the response of the beam section, the cross-section. We, we said that. Theta and W are not dependent on the cross-section. Um, all right. Uh, so, enough of that. I went in. Use the same example problem that we had last week for Euler Bernoulli beam. Uh, took that problem, uh, switched it to Timoshenko here, and ran it, and I got the exact same results. I got a deflection of 0.183. That's what I got with Euler Bernoulli beam also. Um, all right. And so uh, with that, I've covered uh, Timoshenko beam. Uh, with that, I also feel that I have completed 1D finite elements. Uh, to the best extent possible because we did it for heat transfer. We did it for Euler Bernoulli. We did it for Timoshenko. We did it for a fake problem differential equation I came up with. And then we also did it for uh, an elastic bar. And then, top of that, you did it for uh, the cable problem that you're going to turn in this Thursday. So there you have seven problems that we worked through uh, in extensive detail. Uh, and I feel that that should be enough to really get the point across of what we're trying to do here, okay? If you have any questions, I'll be here uh, to take that. Uh, you have a great...